Okay, let's explore cellular automata and um, especially Wolfram's Rule 30. Okay, the way this works is really pretty simple. Uh, I might even mark this as education. Um, and that's sort of the point, that it's very simple, but it leads to a chaotic looking and, and statistically chaotic result, even though it's very, very deterministic, simple uh, system. Okay, with cellular automata, you, um, oh, interesting, so this thing is now cutting my deal, so I have to need it different, here we go, ridiculous. Okay, so cellular automata, we have the rules at the very top, okay, what it is, is, is you start with the row of um, white and black pixels, which we have here right above the yellow, right? I have a big row of white pixels with one black pixel in the, in the middle. And the way we determine what the color will be in the next uh, row of cells, this, this cell, th this row of cells is input to a process. And the process is uh, shown on the top. Uh, basically, the color of a subsequent cell is based on its three parents, its direct parent and its left and right parent, let's call them. And that means that uh, there's eight possible, you know, configurations of, of parents in a binary situation with three parents. So you could see that we've got the first uh, rule is that if there's three black pixels, the cell below the middle one there will be white, uh, two and white is, is white, you know, black, white, black turns into white, and so on and so forth. It's called rule 30 because a short form for this is since each rule has every uh, permutation on the top, these bars of three, then you can say what the results are as a binary number. C0001111110 happens to be 30. Okay, so if you take this, uh, this first row and you process it, what's going to happen? Well, right in the middle, uh, you've got this black pixel so there's a uh, it's white black white up here you see white black white has a black pixel under it so there should be a black pixel under it and to the left here you've got black white white so that's here that's also going to be a black pixel on the other side um, it's going to be white white black also a black pixel so underneath this pixel we should see three black pixels now the rest of these all have all three white parents so they should remain white so boom that's what you get now you get something more complicated here because again there's three black pixels well three black uh, cells rather are going to have white underneath it so we know the center one's now going to become white if you do all the rules for the whole row you get this and it keeps growing and as it grows you start to see you know what you could call irregularities okay if you run it many many generations you get this now this might be hard to tell these things are little perfect triangles embedded there at, at unpredictable locations, chaotic locations on, uh, on our right of this um, graph. So this is many generations, right? It's a one-dimensional cellular automata, so it's just one um, row, and then you have many generations. Okay, so what can we say um, about this is, is the whole thing looks chaotic. Down the center pixel, you have basically a random number generator. It, that series is used as a random number generator in Mathematica because down the center pixel you have basically what would happen if you were to flip a coin. You know, not exactly, but statistically uh, you have something that hovers around 50 percent but never gets cyclic. It never gets cyclic. You can never predict what the next one is going to be based on that series. You simply have to run all the generations which include everything along the cell, right? Now on the left of this it looks a bit uh, regular and again I, I, I urge you to go look at these in higher resolution if you search rule 30 you'll, you'll get plenty of pictures of this uh, on the right side it's regular um, it looks quite regular there's definitely predictable bits and it even looks as though it stays pretty predictable though the uh, the chaotic looking right side continues to encroach onto this non chaotic looking left side so y you never have a series that is completely predictable eventually that chaotic part kicks in after enough generations no matter how far you are uh, to the right 
All right. Well, see, I find this this interesting. Um, first of all, because I'm glad that there is chaos in deterministic mathematics because I believe, like a lot of you seem to, um, and I don't assert it, but I do have to admit I sort of believe this. Uh, there's something mathematical in nature. It's amazing mathematics in nature. How did it get there? How do we thought of mathematics just happens to be in nature? What a big coincidence. But see, we got mathematics as a language of patterns, patterns we learned about from nature. So it's not really that surprising. It's kind of like painting the Mona Lisa and then noticing, oh my God, Mona Lisa looks just like this painting of the Mona Lisa. I've captured her essence. Obviously, the Mona Lisa, the painting must have somehow created or be responsible for the Mona Lisa, the, the person. No, the painting came from the person. It's not that confusing. The mathematics came from reality, so that reality is mathematical doesn't turn out to be that strange. Now, some people like to focus on the fact that this means you could have something that's in principle determined lead to something that in principle uh, can't be figured out. So it is determined, and that explains why we can't figure it out. To me, I was just happy to see mathematics that didn't imply that everything had to be figured out you know, had to be possible to figure out. You cannot figure out where you are in a random series, and that's the statistical random nature of it. The other thing is there's some interesting issues about these rules. Notice information is lost in these rules, and it reminds me a lot of, um, I, I don't know, have you ever thought about uh, dual-key uh, encryption? Isn't that weird how it works? Oh, you didn't think about it? Okay. Well, anyway, uh, you have a public key and a private key. You don't tell people your private key, but you use it to encrypt messages. You tell people your public key. They can use that public key to decrypt your message and tell if it was really you that encrypted it. And yet you can't, so you can use the key to decode the information, but you can't use the information to decode the key. So it's a non-reversible process. How the hell do you do that with mathematics? Well, there's non-reversible functions in mathematics. For example, modulus, and that one's used in encryption modulus where you take the remainder you know 10 modulo 3 is 1 because 10 divided by 3 is 3 with remainder 1 you do that it like wraps around you can't go backwards you can't find out you can't find out whether that 1 could have been 3 into 10 it could have been 3 into 13 you know lots of things have remainder 1 well this is what these rules do as well because there's three parent cells and you have one cell below Right, So if you see a cell that is white, you don't know which parents said it has. There's four parents it might have had in this. Now you can do kind of a minesweeper thing and look at, at uh, you know, do some deductions about what the previous generation is. And actually I plan to do that. See if it could be figured out. How, how much is this reversible? Which parts of this are reversible? But I pretty much know already from the characteristics of this mathematically the randomness, it is not fully reversible. So, um, I say pretty much no because I, I'm not entirely certain about that. I haven't seen that analysis. But I know in principle it's not reversible from a single cell, perhaps from analyzing all the logical consequence. But what I think is we're going to analyze that and find out there's certain parents that might be white, might be black, because either way would have resulted in the same little segment. Another interesting thing is the way this works. Notice how he runs these up to the edge of his little grid here. Well, if there's any other dots anywhere in this space, they would impose down on these generations, and they would impact this particular generation. So there's really a kind of an idea that this is isolated in all of space with an infinite number of white pixels going out to the side. He uses a finite segment of it, but that implies this infinite white thing, though he never continues to... Uh, to iterate them in his, in his book, he even leaves that space because uh, as soon as you get to the edge of this grid, you can't use these rules anymore because uh, the grid's a finite space. So those are interesting issues to think about, about what it takes to get chaos into deterministic, uh, um, you know, into a deterministic process. And, and I think at least a part of that is non-reversible mathematical uh, processes where uh, you lose information. Uh, yet another thing telling us there's some fundamental uh, issue in, in material world that has to do with information and you can you know, lose or not lose it.